Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our weekly horticulture town hall, our gardening question and answer here in Missouri. We're so glad that you're able to join us. My name is Tamara Rial, and I'm your host for today. I am located over in the urban west region part of the state um, by, by Kansas City. So our horticulture specialists today that are joining us, let me show you the map. Um, right here, you can see where your horticulture specialist is. Today, we have Jennifer Shooter from the Northeast region in Kirksville. We have Katie Kamler from the East Central region in St. Genevieve. Kathy Meacham uh, from Northwest region in Carrollton. She's also listed as the Ask Questions here. So if you have questions, um, look, look for her. Donna Oftenberg from the Southeast region by Cape Girardeau and Kelly McGowan from the Springfield area. Also from campus, we have Lee Mil Dr. Lee Miller and Jared Fogg and uh, Pong Ting Tian and Pat Gnan, um, as well as Dave Trinkline. So I hope that you will uh, recognize that we are all here to help you. And that uh, anyway, so we're, we, uh, today we have several great questions, um, but we, we might also have time at the end for questions. So if you, if you have something that you want to add, so please be thinking of any questions that you might have for your garden that you would like to ask us. So with that, I am going to turn the time over to Kelly. Right, thank you, Tamara. So we will start out today by getting into our weather report with Pat Ganan. So Pat, I'll turn it over to you. Sounds good. Thank you, Kelly, and good afternoon, everyone. I'll get right into it. Well, we're a little over halfway through the month of August, so I thought I'd look and see what our temperatures have been like. On the left, you'll see these are temperature departures. We've really had not a bad summer considering we know what summers can be like in Missouri when it comes to heat and drought, but for the most part, our summer has been somewhat benign this year in regard to temperatures. And for the first half or first 18 days of August, you can see these greens are indicative of below normal temperatures and they're generally pretty much seasonable. That's what we've seen for the summer so far, but running a little bit below normal, about one to two degrees below normal in some areas. So not, not a bad summer so far with a couple of weeks left of the, of the summer season. In the upper right, we can see what current conditions are like across the state. This is from the Missouri Mesonet. You can get the latest five minute weather conditions at mesonet.missouri.edu. And as of about uh, 10 minutes ago, you can see temperatures are in the low to mid eighties across the state. Uh, there's cloud cover and showers impacting parts of Southern Missouri, especially Southeastern um, and South Central parts of the state. Look at this temperature just before noon in Mountain Grove in Wright County, 69 degrees. They've been getting some showers. And of course those clouds also inhibit those temperatures from getting too high. And they're generally running in the middle seventies in parts of Southeast Missouri. And in the lower right, you can see this area of rainfall. This, this is generally light showery conditions, a little bit heavier here across Northeast Arkansas. Uh, this is taken about 30 minutes ago, and this is generally moving in a northeasterly direction, east northeasterly. So it does look like Southeast Missouri is gonna be in the shower activity throughout much of the day into the afternoon. I do see a little bit of activity trying to fire up here in southwestern parts of the state, but much more scattered and isolated. The highest likelihood obviously will be across south central and far southeastern Missouri as we go through the course of the day. This is the uh, rains over since we last met. This, these are radar estimates over the past seven days of who's been getting the rain. Over the past week in uh, West Central Missouri, they got some big rainfall and they needed it. They had been very dry up until uh, last week, but they got some big rains. You could see more than two inches, generally from around St. Joe, south of Kansas City, south of Kansas City, here in Cass County. Many reports of over two to three, even more than five inches in Harrisonville. Uh, these areas of greens are indicative of generally a half to one to one and a half inches. So some good rainfall, but a little bit more scattered as you go over across the south central, southwestern parts of the state where we can stand to use some rain. It's been very dry in pockets of southwest, south central Missouri, even up into central parts of the state and far northwestern Missouri, we could stand to use a little bit more rainfall. The table here at the bottom shows actual rain gauge reports. You can see in Poplar Bluff, Butler County, over five inches over the past seven days. As I mentioned, south of Kansas City and Harrisonville, over five inches and around Clay County. On Southeast Missouri, Wayne County and, and a little area up here in Northeast Missouri, Scotland County had over uh, three inches of rain. So some 
heavy rainfall where if you were lucky enough to be under one of those heavy thunderstorms. This is rainfall over the past 30 days. So this really start, sort of indicates the drier areas of the state. And again, over the past four weeks, uh, you can see this little corridor extending from south, far southwest Missouri up into central parts of the state. These lighter greens and blues indicative of the driest area of Missouri. The reds are the wettest areas, northeast, southeast Missouri, parts of west central Missouri with the, that rain they received last week. On the lower left, these are some of the heaviest uh, four week totals or over the past 30 days. And again, you can see parts of southeast and northeast Missouri where many areas saw it more than six to over eight inches here in Butler County, this little pink spot you see right here. But these are the wettest areas and then in the driest areas, again, far southwest Missouri. Uh, McDonald County, just west of Anderson, they've only had 700. So obviously very dry conditions in a lot of these areas in southwest Missouri, and that extends up into parts of central sections as well. Many locations have seen less than a half inch in these drier areas. It does look like we're going to have more opportunities for rainfall. I think the biggest chances was evident by the radar that we just saw earlier. Highest likelihood of receiving some significant rainfall today will be across south central, southeastern parts of the state. Those chances will decrease, become more scattered as you go northward into central and northern Missouri. Highly unlikely we'll see any rainfall in northern parts of the state, generally along and south of I-70 today, and that will continue into tomorrow as well. Seasonable temperatures, generally highs in the mid to upper 80s for today and tomorrow. It does look like on Friday, Thursday night into Friday, we'll see our best chances of precipitation statewide as we have a frontal boundary moving from the north. Triggering the, triggering the chances of showers and thunderstorms across northern Missouri, and that will translate eastward and southeastward as we go into the day on Friday and Friday night. As the front moves through the state, we'll see lower chances into Saturday and uh, slightly less humid. I think the best day of the week as we go into the weekend will be Sunday with generally seasonal temperatures and lower humidities. But between now and at least it looks like through Saturday, uh, areas of the state will see some various chances of some showers and thunderstorms. This is a forecast of precipitation over the next three days. That's the highest likelihood of receiving rainfall across the state of Missouri. It looks like it's confined mostly to the southern third of the state for the heaviest precip, generally from a half inch to perhaps over two inches in the Missouri boot hill. So it'll be nice to hopefully see some, maybe that areas of southwestern Missouri that have been very dry lately, pick up some of this uh, shower and thunderstorm activity. Lighter amounts as you go north, but I will preface, you know, take this map with a grain of salt because if you're fortunate to be under one of those thunderstorms, it can drop a lot of rainfall in a short period of time. But overall, it looks like the heaviest likelihood for widespread precipitation over the next few days will occur generally across the southern third of the state. This is a forecast for next week, next Monday through Friday. It does look like temperatures are going to rebound back to above normal with high heat and humidity. So I wouldn't be surprised to see heat indices perhaps making it into the triple digits on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday of next week with a above normal temperatures forecast that would put highs in the mid nineties as we go into Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. There are indications, perhaps another system impacting our state by midweek into the latter part of next week. And that'll bring some chances of showers and thunderstorms. They are indicating near normal uh, opportunities for precipitation as we go through next week. And Kelly, that's pretty much a weather report. I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks so much. Okay, very good. Thank you, Pat. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get into our questions and topics that we're going to discuss today. And I'll just um, reiterate what Tamara said. We, we may have some time for just impromptu questions at the end of our session today. So be thinking about some things you might like to ask. And if we do end up having time, we will uh, put out a call for those. So with that, our first topic today is about Hosta X. We have had some inquiries and questions about this particular issue. So Dr. Pong Tian from our MU Plant Diagnostic Clinic is going to talk to us about that. Pong? Hello, everyone. Let me first share my screen. All right, good morning, no, I'm sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, let's talk about hosta. Hosta is such a lovely plant. There are so many different varieties to choose. Depends on your preference. You can pick the plants with 
different size, different height, different texture, different color, or even different pattern on the leaves. They can grow very well uh, because they're being considered very reliable and they can grow very well in the area that does not have a lot of sunlight. And they're also really easy to grow and they're perennial, so they can, you can cut back in the fall and uh, they will pop up in the spring. Another uh, upper side of this, this uh, plant is that uh, hosta don't have many fungal and bacterial diseases. So far, according to the Penn State Extension, only anthracnose, which is a foliar disease, and the fusarium root rot, which is normally happen when you overwater the plants, as well as the bacteria, soft rot, and nematode damage were reported so far. However, the hosta plants do have viral disease. So today I'm going to focus on one specific hosta virus. It's called hosta virus X, HVX, not HIV, HVX. So before I go into detail about this virus, I would like to tell you a story about my lab. It's, it happened early this year when I just reopened my lab and this is the first couple of samples I received in the lab. And I'm not really familiar with this virus. So a client sent in this sample. And when I look at the, uh, look at the photo, I saw those kind of like a bubbling, which is a scientific term called a rugos. And you can tell on this plant, there has some discolored area, some bubbling, some leaf curling. So when I compare those two photos online, and I don't really think it's a host virus X. Thankfully, this client's really, really uh, care, careful. So he insisted to send a sample to us. So after using the serological test to test the virus, it, it was confirmed with host virus X positive. So that made me kind of like, that kind of like really shocked me. So from that day, I remember in that weekend that we went to St. Louis Zoo. And that's a time that all kinds of plants are kind of like flourishing and uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, everything was kind of like a, a lot of blossom and it's really beautiful. But all I focus is hosta in the zoo. So when I look at the different variety of hosta, you can tell this one had this color edge. This one has also has rugos, and this one had those curling and also uh, bubbling thing. And this one on the edge, you can see the different color. And uh, uh, you can tell this one also had those symptoms and this one similar. So in the end of the day of that trip to St. Louis Zoo, my conclusion is that all the hosta has virus <laughs> in the zoo. That's not possible. So after my conversation with the state's field uh, specialist, as well as our horticulturalist uh, scientist, uh, well, I finally learned something new to me. So first, there are so many different varieties of cultivars, and the appearances can be very deceiving. Second, the treat of the rogus is not a characteristic to determine HVX. We actually have some variety they specifically have this symptom, uh, have this characteristic. Third, if you want to determine whether your plant is healthy or not, have a virus or not have virus, it's better to compare the suspect, suspected plants together with the healthy plants that belong to the same variety of cover side by side. Again, always consider sending sample to MU Plant Diagnostic Clinic. We have the specific uh, virus tend to confirm it. So now let's move on to talk about the symptoms. I guess you guys are all very interested in what exactly symptoms for the HVX. So like I mentioned, it's always better to put the healthy plant and also the dead plant side by side. Let's look at the first photo. I forgot to acknowledge it. Those photos are from Purdue University. So you can tell from the, the two photos and you can tell these are healthy plants, they are healthy plant, but the disease plant look like this and this. And the symptoms of the HVX may express as green and yellowing modeling of the leaf blades. And uh, sometimes they will have some circular discolor area or twisted leaves. However, like I mentioned, the appearance of the symptom can vary widely 
by the cultivar or variety and also the color of the foliage. So let's, let's switch a gear. Let's go to a little bit hard uh, section. Let's clear some confusion we have received so far. Let's talk about the first question. HVX is a viral disease that only affects hosta, correct or incorrect? Actually, it's correct. HVX is host specific. If you have this disease confirmed in your yard, it will not affect other plants in your yard. However, hosta does uh, have different virus that have a wider or broader host range, such as like TMV or some type of necrotic virus, they can affect the other one, but that does not apply to HVX. Let's move on to the second question. HVX is transmitted by insect, therefore pest control is very important. Sounds really reasonable, but it's incorrect. HVX is only transmitted by infected sap through dividing or trimming. So every time you are handling the HVX infected plant, you'd better be careful so that you will not uh, trigger any cross contamination. The third question, HVX will kill the plant very fast. Incorrect, HVX may not show up in the first year of infection and also the symptom may not show up, even though the HVX test will test positive. And it may not kill the plant immediately. It may take years, like one to three years to kill the plants uh, gradually. Let's move on to the next question. Infected plants will survive the HVX if you take good care of your plants. It is wrong. If you have any plant confirmed with HVX, it will continue weakening the plants and uh, the plants will eventually die. The last question is, symptoms of HVX look attractive to me. Shall we pretend that there's no virus and it will go away? Not Unfortunately, the it's incorrect. We had a big party afterwards. I'll see if I can find the party. So it will be irresponsible to keep infected plants around. If you have an infected plant confirmed, it, it would, they will become they will, the viral disease will continue to develop and your plant will become inoculum source and it will affect other healthy plants. I already cleared up several confusions. Let's still take a look at disease management. If you pick plants, always choose the disease-free plants from the nursery and always pick some virus resistant plants that are, that are tolerant on the virus. Although I know that uh, those virus can change over time and some resistant plant may turn to be susceptible plant, but still always pay attention to the plant source, make sure they're disease free and resistant cultivar. Second, I mean, third, keep good scouting. If you see any disease plants, um, uh, you'd better to make sure it is a virus positive and negative and uh, uh, treat them immediately. How to treat them? Unfortunately, virus disease cannot be treated with any bactericide or fungicide. The only way to do it is to discard the plant as soon as possible and always make sure you clean your, uh, your tools uh, with the uh, either uh, uh, ethanol or uh, bleach so that it, you will not cause any cross contamination. If you are interested, or oh, you are a great hosta lover, think about joining American Hosta Society. They are really outspoken people. <laughs> That's as far as I, were, uh, I was, I heard. So you will learn a lot more about the disease or the care, how to care for the hosta plants. Um, that's all I have. Um, let me know if you have any more questions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Pong. That was great information. Uh, for those of you that are in the Springfield area or surrounding area, we do have a group uh, that is part of the American Hosta Society here in Springfield. So if hostas are your thing, if you want to learn more about them and get involved with this group, send me an email and let, you, let me know and I'll put you in touch with them. They really are a great group and they have a beautiful demonstration demonstration here at the Springfield Botanical Gardens. So. 
Okay, our next question is about acorns. Um, the question was, why are they so small this year? Does it have to do with rain? Does it have to do with something else? Could it be weather related? So uh, Katie Kamler is gonna ask or answer this question for us. Katie? So yes, you are exactly right on. It is weather related. Uh, acorns don't begin filling until early to mid July. And so therefore no rain or drought conditions means that trees are stressed. Um, they're not actively uh, producing or, or conducting photosynthesis when they uh, are stressed. So if they don't have any food to put into um, acorn production, that makes acorns smaller. I've also seen um, our oak trees here recently that are actually aborting acorns. They're, they're kicking them off, and that's an, also a good sign of stress. Uh, same goes for any, any kind of, of nut tree. Um, I, I believe there was also part of that that was about uh, the same thing with black walnuts, smaller nut size. Black walnuts are a little different in that um, they tend to be biennial bearers, which means they will produce a very heavy crop one year. And a lot of times that means those nuts are smaller because of that crop, that heavy crop load. And then the next year they take a break uh, because of, of um, the, the energy used to produce that heavy crop load the year before. So, so um, in that, that lighter crop load, nuts are bigger a lot of times because um, they have more energy to put into those. Uh, so, so acorns and even, even black walnuts, other nuts, this is called mast is, is a name for that. And a lot of times that is um, a source of food for wildlife. So that could be anything from deer to squirrels uh, and many other animals like that nut mast. That's all I've got. All right, thank you very much. Okay, her next question is about black-eyed Susans or rutabekias. So I'm gonna take this question and share my screen and show you a picture that came in. So this particular picture came in um, about some leaf spot issues on these black-eyed Susans. And the question was, you know, is this a disease? Can it spread to neighboring plants? And basically what this is, is this is likely some type of fungal leaf spot, which is actually pretty common, especially as we get into late summer and early fall. Um, most plants are pretty stressed by this time of the year, just from temperature fluctuations and, you know, heavy rain and then periods of drought. So they're more susceptible to fungal leaf spot. And so a lot of leaves are looking pretty rough right now. So in this particular case, although this is a fungal leaf spot issue and it could potentially spread to neighboring plants, it isn't anything to be too alarmed about at this time of the year. The best thing to do is once we've had a frost and these plants die back to the ground, um, just go, or I'm sorry, the, these plants, the, the foliage dries up, just go ahead and do good sanitation, clean up that dried out foliage, remove it from your flower beds or gardens or wherever it's located. And that can help to prevent those fungal spores from overwintering in the soil and infesting next year's plants. So again, this isn't anything to be too alarmed about this time of the year, um, but but do practice good do practice good sanitation after our first frost. Okay, so let's go ahead and go into our next question. So the next question is about voodoo lily. Um, the question is, they have voodoo lily that is um, surviving in a sheltered area near the corner of a house, and it doesn't bloom every year, but it has the last couple of years now, and now it's developed the, uh, some really cool orange-yellow berries, 
And the question is, are these berries valuable to wildlife or can new tubers be grown from them? Um, so Jennifer, would you like to take this question? Yes, thank you, Kelly. And before I go into actually answering the question, I wanna talk a little bit about this plant. So this is an amorphophallus conjac, also called the voodoo lily. And it is native to warm subtropical areas of Eastern Asia, including Vietnam, Japan, and China, south to Indonesia. So that is where it is native. And I want to provide some interesting information that I found from the uh, University of Wisconsin. And that tip was actually given to me by the individual who is a Kirksville area master gardener, and she is on right now listening. And uh, so she told me where to find the information. And I thought this was fairly interesting. So the starchy tubers are edible and this plant is grown for food in some parts of the world and processed into a tasteless flour or stiff jelly. The Japanese use konjac flour to make shirataki noodles and the starch is used to make a popular Asian fruit jelly snack. The plant is in the philodendron family and produces a single leaf from a tuber. The tuber then shrinks away as a new leaf grows, and during the growing season, a new, larger tuber replaces it. And then when it bloom, it produces an odor like a dead animal, and it is intended to attract uh, carrion flies that are actually their pollinators. Whoops, sorry about that. And here's some information um, that was provided by Dr. Trinkwine that actually answers the uh, individual's question. And the plant can be produced from seeds, but dividing the corms is much faster. Like most of the, and I have such trouble pronouncing these uh, scientific names, uh, era, era ACA family, uh, the seeds contain calcium oxalate crystals. Uh, therefore, I'm not sure if wildlife will eat the seeds. Since it is not winter hardy in the Midwest, growing it for wildlife is not practical, even if they do consume the seeds. The voodoo lily is a close relative of the corpse flower. Members of that genus are notorious for erratic blooming and flowers that smell like rotting meat. And then for gardeners that like the unusual look of an arum, but want one that is more dependable in regards to blooming, there is the Italian arum. And they have several there on the MU campus. They only grow to a height of about eight inches, but do bear brilliant orange fruits every year. So I wanna thank Dr. Trinkline for providing that information. And then I stopped by the Master Gardener's house this morning to get a few photos to share with you. And I want, wanted to show you this interesting stem that the plant has. And then the photo to the right is the actual tuber and you can see the roots um, growing kind of from the top of that. I, and I actually pulled that from the uh, Wisconsin um, website that I found. This plant is growing in a very protected location at the Master Gardener's house. And here you see the uh, big uh, tropical looking leaves. And these leaves are coming out of one stem. So this one stem here, is producing uh, the leaf. And actually, actually, it's one leaf. And they all meet there in the, the center of the plant with the one stem. So it's a very interesting plant. And then here's a flower. Um, it is not a flower now, but the master gardener provided the photo of the flower here. And the flower uh, typically uh, for her uh, blooms in May. And then here's the fruit. So again, this produces, um, you know, a, a toxin that is not going to be real, you know, appetizing to wildlife, we think. So most likely the wildlife are not going to bother this. And then I wanted to show you the exact location. So this is the east side of the house. And you can see that little corner there. And the, um, the, the plant is located uh, behind the other plants that you see right there in that corner. So it's in a very protected location. It has been there for 24 years. So if you're wondering how old is this plant, it has been in the location for 24 years. Um, at the time when the master gardener uh, purchased the house, it was there. 
It does not bloom every year for her. And this is the first time that it has produced a seed head. And if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. And she is on and both of us, along with Dr. Trinkline, will do our best to answer any questions anybody may have. And that's all I have, thank you. All right, thanks, Jennifer. That is such a cool plant. I absolutely love Voodoo Lily. Okay, our next uh, topic for discussion is going to be weed control. And uh, Dr. Lee Miller is gonna talk to us a about a, a couple of weeds to be on the lookout for now. Okay, thank you, uh, Kelly. Let me um, share my screen here, get things started. Um, so over the last uh, couple, couple days, we've had some, some weed reports come in. Um, actually, actually quite a few. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of these because they might be a little bit different and, and it's, you can't really grab any herbicide over the, off the counter and control these if you need to. So I just kind of want to talk about some of these. Um, this one came in and the, and the homeowner thinks that it's, it's spurge. Um, spurge will actually have a, a milk, uh, milky sap that comes out of the stem. We're still kind of looking for that but this looks a lot more like Lespedeza. Um, Lespedeza was actually brought in as a forage type plant um, and has, has kind of escaped somewhat uh, and, and gotten into lawns and it can tolerate low mowing and, and it, can, it can spread fairly quickly. So this is one of the, one of the weeds that we're seeing come in. And then the other one um, I'm very familiar with, this was a, an email that was sent to me uh, again earlier this week and this is violets. So Lespedeza, actually, if you think about weeds telling a story, most of these weeds do um, about why they are more competitive in that environment than the turf grass or the, the lawn that you're trying to grow. So Lespedeza can be an indicator of low pH. So it's, it's a good idea to, to test that pH and, and lime if, if you need to, to raise that pH. And in this case, violets are a huge indicator of shade. Um, I have them in my backyard where I have a, a heavily shaded backyard. And if you get violets growing in that kind of uh, situation, um, they will take over quite quickly. So the common theme between these two is that a particular herbicide um, called triclopyr, that's the active ingredient, is most effective on them. Um, so it's gonna be most effective on violets uh, clover and oxalis and, and things of that nature and, and lespedeza. Um, this is a selective herbicide. So ortho weed begun is not the only uh, product on the market that has triclopyr in it, um, but the, I'm just us, using this one for, for demonstration purposes. But this is one that is selective in that it won't kill your turf grass, but it will kill uh, these particular weeds. So when you're looking at a herbicide, um, particularly in, in us in the, in the community are talking about triclopyr or talking about active ingredients, you're going to find that. And I've kind of highlighted there in the box what it, where you can find this. And it's always going to be under that product name. And we're talking about the active ingredient. And here in this case, you can see that that active ingredient in this product is triclopyr. And, and that's what you would use for either violets or for lespedeza or clover if you wanted to. Now the other aspect and the reason that we're saying this now is that it's important that you're minding your S's. Um, and you know when we get into September, particularly if you have a weed issue or say you have some brown patch in your lawn or you have some thin areas, it's important that we look at September as that recovery time when we can fertilize and when we can overseed and rebuild that density. So the problem right now, and I do want to point out that seed is organic. Um, so if you don't want to use herbicides, this is definitely a way um, to make sure that you're, you're maintaining the quality of your lawn. But the other aspect is, and the reason I'm mentioning about selective herbicides now is that most of these herbicides, in fact, I would go ahead and just blanket label all of them that won't kill your lawn now, um, they, the seeding is gonna occur three to four weeks after. So if you're gonna make any of these selective herbicide applications, 
for these broadleaf weeds, you need to do it now. So then you can plan for four weeks, a month later, when we get into that prime time of mid-September, when you can seed and fertilize and aerify if you need to. Um, so that's, that's all that I have. Um, Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so next we are going to go into our friend or foe segment and talk about some insects. So Tamara. Thank you. All right, everybody get ready to participate. I am going to go ahead and activate the poll and um, tell me whether or not this insect is a friend or foe. I'm going to give you about 10 seconds. All right, get your guesses in there. Most people have, have put it in there. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and then I'll show you the results. Hold on. There we go. All right. So hopefully you can see the results. Um, I am going to put them on, hopefully on the screen, so those who are, are streaming on YouTube with us are able to see it as well. Never seem to be able to trick you guys very well. You guys are you guys are on it. Um, let me show you what what I said. This is a foe. So this right here is the cucumber beetle. And I will put more information in the chat in just a little bit. But uh, this is, like I said, this is a, a cucumber beetle, specifically the spotted cucumber beetle. Um, and, and in the inset is a striped cucumber beetle. The spotted cucumber beetle, the one right up here, this is also known as the Southern corn rootworm. In Missouri, adults can appear in cucurbit fields from mid-June to early July. Uh, these beetles can actually overwinter here if we have a mild winter in our Northern areas, but they also migrate up from the Southern states each year. So the, the spotted uh, cucumber beetles, the adults, they're very attracted to cucurbits. Um, those would be like our, our uh, all of our squash plants, cucumbers, uh, zucchini, things like that. Um, so they can actually cause major damage to our plants. And like I said, there's, there's another one, this striped cucumber beetle. Um, they, they are completely different species, but they cause very similar damage. Both beetles, they carry a type of bacteria that causes bacterial wilt in susceptible cucurbits. Um, and this is what it looks like. So this bacteria is actually held in their guts and then it spreads when the beetles feed and poo on the plants. The only way to prevent the disease is by controlling the beetles before they transmit the bacteria. So if you see symptoms of bacterial wilt, it's actually too late to treat. So, so don't, don't try to do that. The control methods, um, like I said, if you see the beetles, the control methods to do before you start seeing it, the problem is uh, trap cropping, there's mass trapping. There are some chemical controls, such as applying an insecticide uh, in the soil before or during transplanting. Like I said, I'll put some more links in the chat uh, to, so that you can learn some more about these beetles and how to prevent damage from them. So that's it, back to you, Kelly. All right, thank you very much. Okay, next we are going to talk about kind of a timely topic that we're starting to see some evidence of, and that is fall webworm. So Kathy is going to talk to us about that. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. I've been receiving calls about this, as I know others have. And um, so, and if you don't know what it is and you're, or you've never seen it, it is pretty alarming, but mostly it's a cosmetic issue. And so that's the good news. Um, it's not gonna damage the tree usually um, over the long haul. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot to change my... So this is a picture of one, a tree that's completely covered that doesn't usually happen. You usually just see it 
on the tips where the larvae are building their webs. And you can see this from June to September. And that webbing actually protects them uh, from predators. Here's a picture uh, from the Missouri Department of Conservation of the uh, adult moth. And they emerge from the soil or the mulch. Uh, and the females lay eggs on the leaves, on the underside of the leaves. And they can lay up to 600 eggs uh, or more. And according to the MDC, uh, they can feed on over 100 species of trees and shrubs in Missouri. And that top photo is a picture of the eggs. And then that lower uh, picture, you can see the, um, that the worms have emerged from the eggs and, uh, and they've already started uh, uh, work eating that leaf. Uh, here's just a couple of more pictures of the caterpillar uh, uh, in the webbing on the left and then just uh, more of the adult on the right. Here's a great picture from uh, University of Missouri Extension, and you can see they just devoured that leaf. So like I said, the damage uh, caused is mostly cosmetic. It is unsightly to, to many, many homeowners, but, they, but the damage is uh, rarely severe. It's just not uh, damaging to the tree's health. Uh, another thing is they're eating the leaves that are going to be dying anyway, and so, and they don't eat the leaf buds. So in the spring, uh, you can't see any evidence of the damage. Um, they do have natural enemies. And this is a picture of a wasp eating, uh, feeding on that uh, larvae. And uh, so birds and small mammals eat the larvae and the spiders and bats eat the adult moths. Also wasps, like in the picture, ants and beetles, um, and some fly species also eat the larvae. Uh, you can, because the question often comes in, what is it? How can I control it? How do, how do I kill it? What do I do? So in small trees, you could gently pull down, uh, pull down the webbing and uh, get rid of it. You can drop it in soapy water, drop it in a trash can, uh, bury it. In larger trees, it's a little bit harder, but you can, uh, if you can reach it, you could poke holes in the webbing um, and then that would help, you know, the natural enemies to get to get to them. But uh, pesticides are just not very effective. For one reason, it, we say that is because it is mostly a cosmetic issue and not and doesn't damage the tree. But also that webbing is pretty heavy and the pesticide, it, it would uh, be hard to penetrate it. Um, so after they feed for about four or five weeks, the caterpillar crawl down, they spin cocoons, and they pupate in the mulch or the soil. And you may see those webs in the tree uh, through the winter, but uh, knowing the, that they are uh, uh, heavy windstorm or heavy snow can just knock those down. In the spring or in the fall, I mean, um, if you see a white web, you know that's, that's a newer web. In the, but if you see a tan or brown, that's an older web and, and the uh, worms, the caterpillars are not in there. And I believe that's all I have. All right, thank you, Kathy. Okay, well, that is the end of our prepared questions and topics today. So now we're gonna open it up to questions from you. And I'll start by addressing a question that came in the chat box about crown rot in rhubarb. And uh, Pong is gonna talk to us about this. Hello, uh, thanks for the question. I, every time I saw the rhubarb question, I thought about uh, Dr. David Trinkland's wonderful presentation about the um, rhubarb pie in the end of his presentation. Let's talk about the crown of root rot. Um, Tamara did a great job providing information about the fact sheet of the crown rot or root rot and how to, uh, uh, the disease management. Um, the drainage definitely is very important because the, uh, the poor drainage will increase the opportunity or chance of the occurrence of the root rot. And uh, at the same time, the plant will become very susceptible. They will be stressed by overwater um, the condition. So 
I would say for rural disease, first, it is better to determine what type of pathogen we're dealing with, because there are multiple pathogen can cause rural, such as Fusarium, Rhizoctonia, um, Pathium, and uh, Phytophthora. Among all of the pathogen, Phytophthora is the most severe one, and uh, it's a uh, it can kill the plants in a very fast way. And uh, to treat those diseases, uh, increase and improve the drainage is one, um, uh, one method. Second, you can treat the soil with fungicide or you can do the solarization to kill the uh, microorganism inside the soil. At the same time, you made me think about the crop rotation to to plant something that not belong or close to the uh, rhubarb family. So that, um, cause based on your discussion, you have this problem over the past couple of years and the population of the pathogen may start building up in the soil, even though we are treating that very well, increase or improve the drainage uh, because the, uh, the pathogen population really high, it's still hard to, to uh, deal with that. Uh, the third thing is uh, we'll be also uh, um, referring to um, uh, Tamara's suggestion. Uh, think about using the disease-free um, uh, plants and also use some uh, disease-resistant plants uh, so that you can increase the resistant plants and at the same time decrease the population of the pathogen. Uh, that's my uh, uh, my suggestions. And Dr. Trinklin, if you have any more um uh, suggestion or recommendations, uh, please go ahead. Thank you. You know, <clears throat> I know that was a very good job, Pong. Uh, this is something that's made worse because we tend to, in Missouri, have to plant rhubarb in kind of shady areas because it's not very heat tolerant, which means then that the foliage is going to stay moist. And uh, this is kind of an open invitation, but that was a very good presentation. <clears throat> okay, great information. Thank you guys. Okay, so what other questions do we have from, from our audience today? You can just put those in the chat and we will address those. I got one Kelly on when's the best time to uh, transplant hostas. And so I always think of spring as being the best time. And I think that's just because one of the reasons is because it's easier for me. Um, I see them coming up. They're only, you know, four to six inches and easy to dig and, and, uh, and transplant. But you can do it in the fall as well. You'd want to cut off the leaves uh, probably about to six or eight inches and um, use a sharp knife to, to divide them and you probably want to do it kind of early fall so that they uh, have a chance to uh, to get started, but also so they don't just uh, rot from all the rains. And uh, but of course, I uh, hand this over to anyone else that's got ideas on transplanting hosta, uh, Dr. Trinkline or anyone else. No, I think fall is a good time. Uh, let's wait until the heat stress is uh, essentially over because if you plant in the fall, we'll still get some root growth. Even a hosta has stored reserves that will tend to form roots. So we'll have that much of an advantage having planted in the fall versus in the spring. But spring is acceptable, I think fall, though as you said, is better. see another question here about the fall webworms and uh, yes they do come back because they're overwinning in the soil the mulch the leaf litter so cleaning that up would help um, however they don't tend to come back and hit the same tree year after year after year so it is and I mean they could but it's just we don't see much of that and um, so cleaning up would help but yes that is um, why they do come back, but they must, they uh, uh, go over to other trees as well. All right, very good. Any other questions? 
it is fall gardening time. So I'm sure someone in our audience has some questions. And while we're waiting for some people to put their questions in, I did just drop a whole bunch of links in the chat for upcoming classes that will be offered. We have Soils 101, we have a fall gardening webinar series, we have the Extension Master Gardener mini conference coming up and also produce safety for community gardens. So if you are interested in getting more information, I do recommend you checking out these links. Many of them are free. Um, some of them do have a cost, but it's, it's reasonable. So I, I would recommend that you check those out for more information. Very good. Yes, those are some great, great learning opportunities coming up. Okay, anything else? All right. Well, we'll just go ahead and end a little bit early today then. If you do think of questions, feel free to reach out to the Extension uh, Horticulturist uh, near you. And Tamara, I'll turn it back over to you to close us out. Thank you, Kelly. So uh, like you said, that's, that's what we have for you today. But if you wanted to go back and look at anything that we talked about, we are now streaming live on, on YouTube, on our uh, MU IPM channel. So if you wanted to go back and look, uh, not only is it streaming live, but the entire thing is recorded. So you can go back and look at everything that we just talked about. Um, I, and you can see that on the on the screen, um, just go to YouTube, type in MUIPM in the search box and it'll take you there. I hope that you do subscribe and you'll be able to um, see it pop up anytime we have a new, a new um, video come up. Also, let's see, there we go. Um, this, this meeting, our horticulture town hall is weekly from noon to one. Um, you can see some more dates that we have coming up. If you have questions that you want to have answered that we can prepare for beforehand, you'll need to register for this and you're able to submit your question then. Um, I do see that there are a couple more questions that came in. Um, so uh, if we want to grab those, we can go ahead. Um, I'm going to just show the next screen and then um, Kelly, I'll give it back to you so that you can, <laughs> you can hand it off to someone else who can answer those questions. But um, if you do have questions that you want us to answer in advance, uh, this is the website right here, this ipmmissouri.edu at town halls. And when you go there, even if you've already registered previously, if you go there, it gives you um, a box where you can ask your question. Okay, so Kelly, do we, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, let's go ahead and take these questions that have come in. Um, uh, the first one here is our beets frost tolerant. So if you were to plant those now or into the fall, are they frost tolerant? Would any of our horticulturists like to take that one? Kelly, this is Justin K. I, I can answer that one. So uh, beets are tolerant of a light frost. So air temperatures from 28 to 32 degrees, the leaves can tolerate that <clears throat> without um, damage and plant death. Uh, but when you get below those temperatures, the tops will probably die. Um, the, the beet roots themselves, the harvestable portion uh, might still be in good shape um, below those temperatures, but probably best to get them out of the ground uh, prior to that, or think about something like using a row cover um, to protect those. And <clears throat> Tamara just dropped a link in the chat box, the MU Vegetable Planting Calendar. That's a really great resource to think about planting dates for fall crops. There's date categories for both South, Central, and Northern Missouri. Um, parts of the Ozarks are actually, I believe, in the, uh, they're, they're in the Northern planting dates just because of the little bit higher elevation. But um, that's a great resource for planting dates for all kinds of potential fall vegetable crops. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, it looks like we have a question that has came in about nut sedge. Um, Kathy, or is, is the question just on how to control nut sedge? It's not really a question, it's just asking, can we talk about um, nut sedge? So usually it is about control and um, I'll turn that over to someone. 
it pulls real easy. I know that, but the root system doesn't help much because of a, the root system. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I, can, you... I can help with that. Um, so Nutsudge actually uh, kind of has tubers underneath and, and has a really extensive um, kind of spreading system from, from a single plant. Uh, so it, it can be difficult. Nutsedge is an indicator of poor drainage. So in your landscape where you have a lot of water that kind of goes, you know, particularly that can include gardens, um, nutsedge is an issue. On lawns, there are, there are a number of different nutsedge products. The one that, I, that comes to mind is sedge hammer. Um, all of those will have some kind of the active ingredient, which I showed earlier, will have some kind of sulfuron in it. So like halosulfuron or metsulfuron are two of the, the more common pro, uh, herbicide active ingredients that will control nutsedge. Um, we, I think we fielded this question about nutsedge control in a garden. Um, and that really, I think, is going to have to come down to, to hand pulling. Um, I don't think you want to apply either one of those herbicides into a, into a garden. So I'll, I'll stop it there because I see another question in the chat. Hey, yeah, I think we have time for, for one more question. So we'll, we'll address this one. Uh, what is the best time to trim shrubs such as boxwood? Kelly, I'll go ahead and uh, take that. Uh, boxwood is, of course, a broadleafed evergreen. And even though the temperatures might not be conducive to rapid growth, it still will grow during the winter until we get into some very, very cold temperatures. So far, non-blooming, of course, boxwood blooms, but we, we don't really recognize it as a flowering shrub. Any time is fine with regard to uh, either shaping it up a little bit or heading it back or so forth. But it will continue to grow slowly throughout the fall into the early winter, and then again next spring uh, a bit more vigorously. But now would be a good time if indeed the uh, plant or hedge is overgrown. Okay, very good. Okay, well, that is our time for today. Thank you for joining us, and uh, hopefully we will see you next week.